Happy Father's Day, Dad. We love you. One of our favorite memories with our dad is playing Mario Kart with him all the time. <laughs> We've been playing Mario Kart with our dad since we were little kids and we still do to this day. And it's the funnest thing to do with him. Um, he thinks he's really good even though he doesn't win that often, but it's still so much fun playing with him. He claims that he lets us win, but I don't know. <laughs> Love you, dad. Happy Father's Day. One funny memory that I have of my dad is when my sister and I were really little and my mom went out for the day and my dad was taking care of us and we happened to find a mouse in our basement that day and our dad let us bring in our pet caterpillars into the house and we were able to play with this mouse and our caterpillars in the house all day and it was one of the best days ever and I'll never forget it. I love you, Dad. Why do melons have weddings? Why? Because they can't elope. <laughs>Hello and welcome to Calvary. My name is Andrew and I'm the lead pastor here at Calvary and I want to welcome you into our service and thank you for joining us. To all the dads out there, the men who pour into us and build into our lives and especially show us what it looks like to follow Jesus, thank you for your, your example. Happy Father's Day to you. To our guests, to those who are new to Calvary Online or maybe you just haven't had a chance to connect with us just yet, I'd encourage you to fill out the connect form in the description below. We would love a chance to talk to you and meet you someday soon. Uh, for everyone, I'll make sure that you check out the announcements at the start of this service because we've got lots happening. Next week we have a special service plan to celebrate some of the different ministries that have gone on at Calvary this year and we can't wait for you to see all that we've put together for that. Uh, we're also going to have a prayer time just after the service on Zoom. So, so office at calvarygospel.ca and you can get the link for that. Enjoy the rest of the service. Good morning, Calvary kids. My name is Amy. Some of you know me as Auntie Amy. I was just reading in my Bible in Acts 26 about Paul. Last week we learned how Paul got arrested in Jerusalem and today we're going to hear about him being in front of these two really important men, Agrippa and Festus. What incredible names those are, eh? Anyways, Paul goes in front of these men and he has the opportunity to tell them all about Jesus and what a big change he's made in his life. You know, we can do that too. When I was a little kid, I used to be scared all the time. And then, you know what, I asked Jesus into my life and he made a big change because then I knew I was never alone anymore. Jesus also helps me to make right decisions and not to sin. And even when I do, because I still do mess up sometimes, I know that if I talk to him and ask him to forgive me, he will. And someday I get to live with him forever. You know, today after the service, you can go and talk to other people, maybe in your family, and ask them what change Jesus made in their life and you could tell them about him in your life too. I'm gonna ask a few people right now in my family what change Jesus has made in their life. Come on and take a listen. I'm outside right now with Uncle Bill. Uncle Bill, can you tell me what change Jesus made in your life? Well, Aunt Amy, it's like this. Ever since I was little, I've loved to take things apart and put them back together and fix them. Of course, when I was little, I mostly just took them apart. But life sometimes does things, and you find yourself breaking things or making mistakes or doing things that you shouldn't, and you can't fix it. Jesus fixes it when I can't, and I really appreciate that about Jesus because it drives me crazy, and Jesus takes care of it. So now we're outside and I'm here with my sister, Jerry, and I wanna ask her a question. Tell me, what change did Jesus make in your life? Ah, well, when I was eight years old, that was when I first found out that I could have a relationship with Jesus and I accepted him as my savior. And as I was growing up, you learn lots of things and sometimes there are harder things and tougher things that happen as you get older. 
But what I learned about Jesus and my relationship with him that changed me the most was that he was my best friend. He was the friend that would never ever hurt me or hurt my feelings or disappoint me or not be there for me. He truly became my forever best friend. And I love that about Jesus. And he has also taught me that love is way bigger than I thought it was. And the fact that he loves me as much as he does has also changed me because it's taught me how to love the people that are in my life. Today, after the message from Pastor Andrew, why don't you get together with your family and tell them all about the change Jesus has made in your life and then ask them to tell you their story. Maybe you're not there yet and you haven't had Jesus change your life yet and it's time for you to ask him. Talk to your mom and dad and ask Jesus to come and live in your heart and to help you to be a better person and to live for him. And then you can tell others about the big change Jesus has made for you. Don't forget kids to check out the Calvary resources for kids in the email that your parents got today or on the church website and have a great week. Well, thanks again for tuning in to Calvary Online. I want to describe your worst nightmare, at least when it comes to a conversation. You're sharing a story and you've got people listening to you. And then you get to the punchline. You're ready to make your big point. And it's crickets. Nobody responds. Or worse, you, you're ready to make your big point and you forget what your story was about. You forget the punchline. Or have you ever had this happen to you? Uh, you get through, you make your big point, you say the punchline, and then people say, so what? What difference does it make? Why do I care? Have you had someone respond that way to you? Have you ever been telling the story of why your faith is important to you and had someone respond like that? Let me give you a couple of examples. You're, you're trying to convince your kids that church is important that you'd love them to go with you or just to get up on time for online church, but they don't want to. Or you're talking with your adult children about your grandchildren and how you'd love to see them coming to church because they don't go anymore. And inevitably, the conversation gets to, Dad, Grandma, Gigi, you don't really think church is that important. Come on. Like, it's not like church can save you. What do you say? Or maybe if you're on social media, you put in your profile, I heart Jesus. And then a friend asks you about it. Or, or worse, they start ragging you. They start chirping you and getting on you about your faith in Jesus. What do you do? Or a coworker, a friend asks you to hang out on Sunday morning. Uh, but you were thinking about going to church. And now you've got a choice to make. Uh, do, you, do you tell them what you're planning on doing? Do you, do you bring up a conversation that might lead to faith? Or do you just sort of dodge the question and avoid the topic? In our last stop in the book of Acts, I want to take you to a similar situation that Paul was in. And if you're just joining us for this series, if you're new to Calvary, we've been tracking through the book of Acts. Uh, a guy named Luke wrote the story, and so much of it has to do with his friend Paul and his faith in Jesus and how he explained that faith everywhere he went. And so the last couple of weeks, we have been talking about Paul's stop in Jerusalem. Uh, you can turn to Acts chapter 26. You'll be right there with us in your Bible. Or... In the link below, there's, a, there's an opportunity to download YouVersion app. And if you just download that, you can have a Bible right on your phone. Acts chapter 26, you'll be right there with us. In our story, uh, Paul has now four times had a near-death experience. Uh, he's been before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leaders. He's been before uh, governors. Uh, and now the king, the king of the Jews has come to town, Herod Agrippa II and Bernice, his half-sister. And, and as they come into town, they want to hear what Paul has to say. And so Paul is brought out to explain why is Jesus important to you? What do you do in that situation? A friend, someone you love, asks about your faith. Uh, your boss, someone who can control your career path, uh, wants to know what's this Christian business. Somebody you respect asks about why Jesus is so important to you. When pressed to explain why Jesus is so important to you, what do you say? Well, as we go through this story with Paul, we're going to get an example of how he shares his story. And, and for those of you who call yourselves Jesus followers, we are going to get essentials of a story worth telling. 
But even if you don't call yourself a Jesus follower, I think you're going to really enjoy reading through Paul's story and what he has to say. And you'll even be able to see exactly what Christians believe through Paul's story and maybe what your Christian friends hopefully have already been talking to you about. So thanks for being here. Uh, Paul's first tactic as he begins defending his faith. Uh, that's, he gives a defense here. That's where we get the word apologetics, um, defending the Christian faith. That's right here in this story. We're going to see that word. But as he begins, he does the respect and connect. Here's what he says in verse 2. King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make my defense. There's that word. Against all the accusations of the Jews. And especially so because you're well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. Paul begins by simply showing respect to the people that he's talking to. Uh, King Agrippa, he, he uses gracious and courteous language. He wants to make sure that they're actually going to give him a chance to talk. And then he even tries to connect with the people he's talking to, even his opponents who have tried to kill him four times. Verse 4, the Jewish people all know the way I've lived ever since I was a child from the beginning of my life in my own country and also in Jerusalem. They've known me for a long time and can testify, if they're willing, that I conform to the strictest sect of our religion, living as a Pharisee. And now it's because of my hope in what God promised our ancestors that I'm on trial today. The first step, when somebody presses you about your faith in Jesus, the first step is simply to be respectful and relatable. Uh, a few years ago, I was on a mission trip to Quebec, and uh, first day we're there, literally the first day, uh, this girl from Montreal is giving us a tour and, and asked my buddy, hey, do you speak French? Doesn't miss a beat. He says, I don't really like French. <laughs> know your audience. When you want to share why Jesus is important to you, you've got to know who you're talking to. You've got to get to know them. And one of the things that will happen as you hear their story, as you hear some of their doubts and the things that are barriers for them, you'll be able to speak more intelligently about your story. That's what happens for Paul. In verse 8, he says, Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? This is one of the issues for the last two years the Jews have had with Paul. He keeps talking about some guy named Jesus raising raised from the dead. And they say, that's crazy talk. But Paul says, yes, this is your objection. But why? Why is that a barrier for you? So often when people have objections to our faith, though, we get defensive and we just want to counter attack. That's not what Paul does. He empathizes, he listens, and then he relates to them. Verse nine, I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. He goes on in this story to explain. Uh, he would go on the authority of the chief priest and he would throw people in prison. Uh, he would try to get them killed. He made it his life obsession to destroy Christians, to wipe out the name of Jesus. If you want people to care about what you have to say, especially as it relates to your faith in Jesus. You've got to be real with them. The second thing Paul does is he's authentic and he's personal. See, the temptation for many of us as we share our faith in Jesus is we just want to gloss over the difficult details of our story. Like, kind of like when you're putting a picture online and you take all sorts of different pictures until you get the perfect one. And then you add filters and different features to make sure it's this beautiful picture so everyone realizes you're this perfect person, right? Sometimes we do that with our God story, with the story of what God's doing in our lives. But what Paul shows us in his story is you got to be no filter. Uh, this hashtag, you've heard of that also. When, uh, when someone takes a picture, take Zeke, for example. I don't know if you've ever seen his pictures on Facebook of nature and, and different stuff outside. But you take these beautiful pictures and there's no added features, no effects. It's just the raw camera doing what it was meant to do. Uh, when you share your story, be real with people. Be authentic. And that's not to say that you share all the gory details of your story, every single sin that you've ever done in your life. Uh, but don't skim over it. Don't just gloss over it and act like you are some good person and you just needed Jesus to kind of nudge you over the top and make you a perfect person. Because that's not believable. Our authenticity helps people to see themselves in our story. That's why it's so important to be real with them. Paul wasn't glorifying his sin. He wasn't excited by his sin and killing Christians. He considered himself the worst of sinners. He says it to others. Uh, but he was honest. 
And so we need to be honest about the things that are a part of our lives, about the struggles that we have uh, in the past, uh, what our objects were to being to, to following Jesus, but also uh, currently, like the things we still struggle with, the doubts that we still have, people relate to that. But that's not where our story stops. Eventually, the story, the conversation about why Jesus matters so much, it needs to get to Jesus. And that's exactly what happens for Paul. Uh, for us, uh, I think if we're honest with ourselves, um, this is where we botch it the most. You see, we can talk, uh, we can relate to our neighbors, like we can usually connect with them. Uh, we can even get to the point where we share about our stories. We're, we're pretty decent at talking about ourselves. But when the conversation needs to shift to Jesus and to the gospel message, the good news, uh, we get awkward. For some of us, that's when we change the topic. Okay, see, I gotta go, I gotta cut my grass. Or, or we just we just get weird. We change our personality. I know for me, I've got one neighbor who it's been great getting to know him. But every time I, I invite him to church or, or like every time I talk about a church thing with him, I just get awkward. My voice changes and I start sounding like this prepubescent little kid or something. And it's just like, man, relax. Just talk to the guy. Eventually, the conversation has to get to Jesus. And for Paul, uh, he was okay to tell his story, but where he really got passionate was when he got a chance to talk about Jesus. Verse 12, for the third time in the book of Acts, you, you might say it's important to Luke, the guy who wrote the story, for the third time, Paul's going to share the story of how Jesus changed his life. And he talks about being on the Damascus road and how there's this light that was bright from heaven, blinding for Paul and knocked him down. Uh, and Jesus interrupts his life and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goats. It's hard for you to resist and to fight God's will. And then Paul says, who are you, Lord? Here's what Jesus said. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I've appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I'm sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven, first to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and then to the Gentiles. I preached that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. And that's why some Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But God has helped me to this very day. So I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer and as the first to rise from the dead would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. You want to have a story that's worth telling? Make Jesus the hero of your story. We've got to get to a point where we actually share about Jesus. If you can tell your whole story and never talk about Jesus, how do you expect anyone else to, to find your faith important? If you tell your story and Jesus is just sort of a, an asterisk on the side of your story, kind of a sub point that you make, how is anyone else supposed to find faith in Jesus important? If you talk about your faith in Jesus, but all of your stories, all of your references are something that's happened in the past, and you don't describe how Jesus is presently working in your life, how is someone supposed to realize the impact that Jesus can make in their life? Did you notice how Paul, when he shared his story, he talked about his past, he talked about the day that he believed in Jesus for the first time, but he also talked about how God was working in his life presently. Did you see that in verse 22? But God has helped me to this very day. So I stand here and testify to small and great alike. How could we possibly expect anyone else to care about our faith story if Jesus hasn't made a difference in our lives? Festus interrupts Paul's story though. And he says, Paul, you've gone mad. Like your stories, your learning is making you cray cray. Paul says, no, Festus. And again, he's respectful. Most excellent, Festus. 
He says, it's not true. And then he appeals to the king again. He says, King Agrippa, you've heard these stories. Uh, You believe the same Old Testament. They didn't necessarily call it the Old Testament then, but you believe the same Jewish religion that I believe. Uh, We have, we share that hope. And then he kind of corners Agrippa. He says, you do believe the prophets, don't you, Agrippa? Agrippa says, Paul, you expect me to become a Christian so quickly? And then I want you to read how Paul responds. It's one of the greatest parts of this story. Verse 29, Paul replied, short time or long, I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. Uh, I told you at the start, if you wouldn't call yourself a Jesus follower, uh, this story, Paul's story, could explain to you why Jesus is so important to us as Christians. And, and that's our hope for you. We pray that as you're listening to this, as you're realizing that Jesus had to suffer, that he's the God who came to earth to be the saving one, what the Jews called the Messiah. He was the first to suffer and to die, but he was also the first to rise. The reason we believe resurrection is so important because it proved Jesus was God. It proved that all his claims about himself were true. And it reminds us that even when we die in this life, we will rise again. This is the hope we have. This is what it means to put our faith in Jesus. And Paul says, repent, which is a fancy way of saying, turn from your sins. When you believe that and you say, I'm done with my old life, God, I want this new life in Jesus. You too can have the same hope that Paul had. Paul invites Agrippa to believe it. That's the last thing for those of us who are Christians. Invite people to join the story. You've got to actually invite them to have a relationship with Jesus. Uh, Sometimes we get to the whole point and we even talk about God and we even mention the name of Jesus, but we never invite people to believe it. Um, Some of you would know that I I worked in marketing before I got into ministry and and you've probably heard, but marketers are all about the call to action. Uh, They make sure that by the end of their ad, they don't want to just spend two minutes telling you why what they're selling is so great. Uh, Could you imagine if at the end of that, they never told you any contact information or how to buy what they're telling you about? And we're not marketers. We're not trying to sell Jesus. But as you share the good news, you've got to tell people how they can have a relationship with him. The call to action. Invite them to join the story. Uh, but you might say, what if they reject me? Uh, then I've just failed. Then, I, then I'm, I'm doing it wrong. And, and there's no celebration. And well done, buddy. You did it. Uh, what if they say no? Am I just a failure? No. No. It's God's job to change hearts. It's your job. It's your job to share your story and the impact of the message of Jesus has had on your life. But God changes hearts. Leave the results to God. Uh, We're like that guy who brings me every week the News Now paper. Uh, He doesn't stand there and make sure that I read it. He just kind of leaves it out on my porch. Uh, We bring the message. We deliver the message. God changes hearts. But we've got to do our part in sharing the story. And so I want to leave you with a challenge. <clears throat> I'd encourage you, uh, take the next little while, take, take some time this week to think about your story, the story of why Jesus has had such an impact on your life. And try to be able to tell that story, write it down, and then practice saying it in like one or two minutes. Uh, maybe call it the elevator pitch. By the time you get to your floor, you need to be able to say the story. And remember, make sure it's malleable. Uh, depending on who your listener is, you've got to be able to change kind of some of the focus of that. But be real, be personable, be relatable as you share the story. And don't forget, make Jesus the hero. Jesus needs to be the hero of that story. But let me be direct with you. Do your friends know how important Jesus is to you? If your friends can't tell that Jesus is important to you, or if they wouldn't even notice that Jesus is important to you, that might say something about your faith. Maybe he's not actually that big of a deal to you. And why would your friends want to learn more about Jesus if they don't even see how he's impacted your life? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the time that we have had this morning in your word. Thank you again for the example of Paul all throughout 
the book of Acts. Uh, we know he's not perfect. We know he made mistakes along the way, but you used him mightily. I pray for all of us that we would have the courage to walk with you and to believe in you, to, to really be so excited about our relationship with Jesus that we want other people to, to be able to be a part of that, to, to experience the change that he can make in their lives. I pray for anyone who's been on the fence for a while, and again, they're hearing what Jesus can do to change their lives. I pray that they would believe it this morning. Uh, thank you so much for the time uh, that we can have gathered as a church family. Thank you for our fathers and for the men who are mentors and influences in our lives. We pray that you bless them today. We pray that soon we can meet together again as a church family. Uh, thank you for the family that we call Calvary. Thank you for those who are listening this morning. I pray uh, you would use your word to impact their lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Remember, next week we have a really special service plan with a whole bunch of different features. You'll want to check it out, 10.30 on Sunday. Have a great week.